Hello, TPR Nation. This is Amber Kuhn from The Perfect REA. Thank you for joining me on today's Follow-Up Friday. Before I get into today's recap, if you're enjoying our episodes, we'd love for you to give us five stars wherever you listen to our podcast and make sure that you're subscribing so you don't miss an episode. On Monday, Matt and Micah were talking about your profitability and expenses, and that when you sweep expenses under the rug or you're discounting your fee, you tend to justify all those things. And you need to realize that not running an effective business has its costs. The guy said that when looking at fee schedules and advisors' profitability, this is their objective measurement of the value that they're delivering. So to take it back a bit, value itself is subjective. So delivering massive value, sending quarterly value ads, that's subjective. But when a client hires them at a premium fee to deliver service that they could have received online or for a fraction of the price, that client is saying that Matt and Micah are delivering more value than others. And that's objective. So they like looking at these details so they can improve the value that they're delivering to clients and money is a way that they can measure this. Matt said there's two reasons why you need a healthy profit margin. One is so that you can afford the best professional development that there is. And two is that you have to be ready to weather the storm during those times of volatility. So it benefits you, your family, and your well-being, but it also makes you a better advisor. So you know that your practice needs to be profitable, but how do you make a practice profitable? And the guy said, just like with everything else, you need to consider how disciplined you're going to be and make a decision to do the right financial thing, not justify what you're doing. So the guys clarified that when they're talking about profits, they're referring to EBOC, earnings before owner's compensation, the amount that shows up on your tax return divided by the amount that's taken from clients' accounts, and everything else is an expense. Now, one of the ways to do this and to look at your expenses is to start super small. So an example of this is once a year, change your credit card number, which will force you to look at things that you're paying for and see whether you really need those things. That creates a forcing mechanism for you to look at your expenses and programs that you're signed up for if you don't really need them or you don't use them. So overall, you want to look at what are those things that you can choose to consolidate and reduce. So again, with those expenses, you can look at the little things as a good place to start. But the biggest things to look at and the most expensive things are employees, leases, and locations. With employees, you need to look at what your hiring plan is. And Micah recommends putting revenue to households when you're looking at team members and how many more households do you need to bring on to hire a new employee. And that you need to set good expectations for having a decent amount of workload with your employees and set benchmarks in advance for when you bring someone else on. So you want to hire that first employee right away, but you need to take your time with that additional hire. You need to have that revenue coming in first before you're hiring more employees. And remember, this also applies when you're looking at bringing on a junior advisor. You need to look at your capacity and what stage you're at. Where this also comes into play is with some of the traps advisors fall into where they spend money to service clients they don't have, and they throw money at problems thinking it'll solve things. So make sure that you have targeted benchmarks. And for solo advisors, that should be north of 50%. And you have to first see if you're hitting those profitability levels. If not, then stop throwing money at things. But if you're hitting that benchmark, then you need to figure out how are you measuring success with the money you're putting into something? And you need to know when to pull the plug. The formula the guys use is, has this worked in another advisor's office to be successful? And clarification is they don't mean that the advisor is successful, and they've done it. You want that person to show you the growth that they've had with whatever that item is. The other part is whether it involves an activity that you're willing to do. And if it isn't, then you need to pass and find something that you are willing to do. Another thing to consider is if you think something's a shortcut. So anytime you're throwing money at something and you think it is a shortcut to hard work, it's not going to work. So when you look at this and how it ties into profitability, you need to take the same dedication that you're putting into activities into the expenses that you have. And if it isn't going to be profitable, the guy said that you need to kill that activity and move on to the next thing. Let's get into action items. What are your benchmarks? The guy shared theirs. And if you're solo, then it's north of 50%. And if you're enterprise, then that needs to be 40 to 50%. Have a detailed PL that you're sharing with someone else that you respect that can pick it apart and pull out your blind spots. You also need to make sure that you're investing in your professional and personal development. That takes time, energy, and work to do this, especially with our masterminds, but they're transformational. So 
Make sure that you join us at our next one. And if you want information on being a part of our programs, reach out to us at lifestyleattheperfectdiary.com. And then also be sure to save the date for February 21st for our next Nation Power Session on how to double your practice. On Wednesday, Matt was joined by Johans Harrison to talk about estate planning. And it started with a story from Johans about a client who he had been trying to get their estate planning done since 2002. Then in 2020, she was actually on her deathbed when he rushed to the hospital to help her and her attorney get this completed. He said it was the most uncomfortable thing he's ever had to go through. And he decided that he never wanted another client to go through a similar situation. He now has helped over 100 clients put an estate plan together. Now, this has always been something that's been a priority for him, but he believes that it was a combination of having a tool to use and the experience that he went through that helped clients move forward. This has been able to give him as the advisor peace of mind, and it ends up being a relief for clients as well. Matt and Johans pointed out that his story is so important. If you haven't experienced this yourself, it's okay to share that story with others. Even if you're saying, I have a friend who went through this. Now, if you don't remember what that story was, make sure you go back to Wednesday's episode, and we have that linked in today's show notes. When Johans is going through his data gathering with clients, he has some simple questions that he asks, such as, do you have a will? Do you have a trust? Do you have a power of attorney for medical decisions? And do you have a power of attorney for financial decisions? If any of those answers are no, then the follow-up question is, have you ever been in a situation or do you know anyone in a situation that didn't have those documents and they needed them? At that point, the client is about ready to start the plan. From there, he gives information on why it's important to have the necessary documents, and he'll share probate information and why they would want to consider an estate plan. Then he shares a two-page document that explains the estate plan, and the client is then invited to schedule their intake. The company he uses offers it for a fee, and then that's passed on to the client as a part of the overall fee to get this completed. Once he goes through the entire process with the client, the referral generation then comes into play. The clients are naming their beneficiaries and power of attorney, and I'll have a conversation with them about the people listed out and whether they've been notified. Many times they haven't been notified, and so he'll assist with that. That then turns into a referral opportunity. Matt said, this is what separates good advisors with those who are delivering incredible value. By asking that simple question, it can turn into something big. And you're making such a difference in your clients' lives. Let's get into action items. Take an inventory of your practice and how many of your clients have an estate plan and who doesn't. Research vendors. And if you're interested in Encore, mention Johans and you'll get your first plan for free. And if you need to do this for yourself, make sure that you use it. Call your top five clients and mention estate planning and ask if they think that you should focus on it to get their feedback. And if you aren't familiar with estate planning, check out our estate planning masterclass with Micah and Rod Z. And we have that linked in today's show notes. On Thursday, Jamie was talking about building your team and getting the most out of your team members. Jamie said there's a lot of questions out there for how to handle situations if you're not getting the most out of someone or how to work with someone if they aren't a team player. Jamie's answer is kick them off the team because that person doesn't want to go fast and far. However, Jamie brought up what the Harvard Business Review shared on how to handle this situation and why she strongly disagrees with it. The first was inquire about your colleagues' interests, priorities, and motivations to get a better sense of their perspective and causes of their behavior. Jamie said you can't motivate another person. You can inspire them, but you can't motivate them. And their interests and priorities aren't going to make them into a team player. The second was to use this opportunity to revisit the team's purpose and goals. Jamie said that if they aren't a team player, then they don't care about the team's purpose or goals. The third was to look for opportunities to better utilize the uncooperative team members' specific skill set. Jamie said if they aren't cooperative, then they need to go. But if it's someone who's just in the wrong seat, then she does feel like it's her responsibility to make sure that she's aligning them with a job that fulfills their skill set. Now, when Jamie shares her thoughts on this with others, they'll comment that it's all great, but where do you get this talent? She said, there's no talent bank. You have to go find people whose values align with yours and then you have to train them. And this is where she said most people go wrong and that most financial advisors just throw human capital at organizational problems. So they just start hiring more people, but more people doesn't make your life easier. And it takes about a year for someone new to be fully functional and trained. In fact, this is something that she makes sure to share with new team members who might feel like they're drowning or maybe they just aren't capable of doing their job that if they have critical expectations of how fast they should catch on to something, they need to shut the door on those negative thoughts. They should start catching on to things in about six months. 
Jamie brought up how the onboarding process is difficult because it's not something that you're constantly going through. You're not constantly hiring someone. But she shared tips from her hiring and her onboarding process. And it's a long one because she wants someone who's going to be with them long term. She said employers need to be careful about their job offer because she sees them go wrong where they start including benefits that they don't currently offer. So make sure that your one page offer highlights what you're actually offering, not what you're going to offer in the future. That one page should be simple with bullet points of what the perks of the job are. So for Jamie, that's the base salary, technology and conference bonus, in a retreat, hybrid working environment, a high level of all of those things. Then she'll also include the employment agreement and the hybrid agreement. Jamie said, once you get someone for the position that you're hiring for, that's where the work begins for the rest of the organization. You need to have what 30, 90, and 120 days look like and have that scheduled out on a calendar to include time for paperwork and training videos. After that first 30 days, they're meeting with the integrator or lead to discuss what they've learned. And they have the new employee sign off that they were trained and the lead sign off that they discussed it as well. This is tedious, but it's necessary because she doesn't want someone coming back saying that they weren't trained on something. And there should be less hand-holding after that first 30 days than at 90 days Jamie wants to have a review. After the first 120 days, Jamie said that she doesn't want to have to have a check-in for six months. And if she has successfully onboarded someone, she won't need to check in on them with their roles and their responsibilities until about that point. And that check-in should be no more than 30 minutes. And that's a real gauge as to whether things are starting to click for someone. Let's get into action items. If you have someone on your team who isn't a team player, you need to let them go because they need to buy into what you're doing and bring that intensity. Go back and listen to Jamie's podcast on hiring people and make sure that you have your hiring process set up. Before you agree to hire someone, sketch out what 30, 90, 120, and that six-month check-in looks like and what they should have learned by that check-in. And if it doesn't seem as if they're clicking or that they're far behind, then you're not doing anything by keeping them on. Before we go, TPR Nation, if you're ready to grow and dramatically impact your life and those around you, and you want resources to help, reach out to us at lifestyle at theperfectari.com, or you can visit theperfectari.com slash grow. That wraps up this week's recap. Thank you for joining me. And please share this or any of our episodes with another advisor or a team member who you think might benefit from listening. And until next time, happy planning.